Hi everyone, this is the last video of the Serial Communication 2 chapter. I don't know how you are doing with it, Adam, but USB is so interesting that I can't wait to see how it is used. I'd like to welcome everyone once again. That's precisely what this video is all about, Balazs. We have all the devices we need. The development board and two micro USB cables. One cable is plugged into the programmer as usual. This will supply power to the panel. The other cable is needed because we can't use the USB port for programming for USB communication. The port for that is located at the bottom of the panel. For this reason, we need the second cable, which will be responsible for the USB connection between our microcontroller and the laptop. Unfortunately, the development card is designed so that the bottom USB port cannot be used to power the board, and it is strictly forbidden to plug the USB cable into the bottom USB port if the development board is not powered. So, plug in the programmer's USB connector first, then connect the bottom USB connector to your computer. Luckily, the microcontroller on the development board has a USB peripheral and also a USB Phi, that is physical layer, which means that it cannot only generate the logic signals, but also the signal levels directly. Due to the complexity of the standard, we would rather like to demonstrate the use of the USB peripheral as a HID device as a point of interest. What does HID stand for? HID stands for Human Interface Device. So, human interface devices are peripherals that allow humans to interact with computers. So then it's a bridge between human and machine, like a mouse or keyboard? Yes, that's true. In the example code, we will create a mouse that can be controlled by the four buttons and clicked with the button on the side. The program relies heavily on the USB stack released by ST. This means that we will not see the exact register level operation. We will just work at a higher level of abstraction, just like we did in chapter 5. Import the example code lecture 10 USB, then open the .ioc file. If you click on USB OTGFS under connectivity, you will see that it is set to device only. Since we want to connect the development board to the PC, in this system, the PC will be the host and our device will be the device. You can see that the other options include host only and OTG dual role device, both of which can perform the role of their names. Two checkboxes are displayed on the screen. Activate VBUS is useful if you want to monitor when you are detecting voltage through your device's USB port. Activate SOF, where SOF stands for start of frame, gives pulses to the connected device at the start of each frame. The SOF output is usually used to synchronize audio devices. In this case, neither of them needs to be enabled and the SOF output is not even connected to the development board. The parameter settings tab shows the settings for the USB peripheral. I guess the speed option is the most important from here. Yes, here you can set the theoretical maximum speed at which your device will exchange data. Next, click on USB device under middleware and software packs. This menu item can generate modules, libraries and settings that implement complex functionality for us. These will be discussed in more detail later in chapter 22. In the USB device mode and configuration window, you can see that you want to use the configured USB peripheral as a human interface device. At the bottom of the configuration window, under the device descriptor tab, you can enter the device's identification data. The settings PID, that is product ID, and VID, that is vendor ID, should only be changed in very justified cases. The manufacturer and product strings can be changed at will, and this has been done. Are we going to generate code with these settings? Exactly. The development environment will initially generate a sample code for us, created by ST Microelectronics. The result of this example code is a mouse that is recognized by the computer, but does nothing. If you want to make it work, you can do that in the main.c file that we have written for you. If you open it, you can see that we create a structure, initialize the peripherals, including USB, 
and then scan the state of the buttons. The structure contains four bytes of data. This is what we will send out each cycle using the USB HID send report function. The function has three parameters. In the first one, we need to specify the pointer to the USB device handler. The second is the structure itself. And in the third, we specify the length of the structure. By changing the values after reading the states of the buttons, you can define how much the mouse moves and which button is used to click. The mouse step size parameter is set to four, which means that the mouse cursor will move four pixels for each button press. The X and Y coordinates of the mouse movement are set according to the direction of each button. It's important to note that the absolute position of the mouse is not specified here, but how much it should move on the screen. Balash, please upload the code and let's try out our brand new mouse. All right, let's see how it works. I'm going down now. I try to open a software. I have successfully opened the software and closed it. It looks like our mouse is working fine. In this chapter, you've been introduced to three asynchronous serial communication protocols. But what are they for? Each piece presented is different. UART is used over a very wide range in terms of speed and requires minimal extra information to transmit. Isn't this referred to as overhead? Yes, it is. We call overhead that part of the transmission that is not carrying the useful information or data, but is needed for the communication protocol to work. With the same parameters used in the UART example code, two bits, the start and the stop bits of the 10-bit frame are the bits that are not useful data. In contrast, for CAN, a significant portion of the frame is for control and other built-in functions. This means a much higher overhead, but in return, less chance of passing erroneous data and a speed comparable to the faster UARTs. It's not negligible that more than 100 devices can communicate on the CAN bus, while UART has a point-to-point -to -point topology. The odd one out in this case is USB, as it is not clearly comparable to other asynchronous serial protocols. USB perfectly and uniquely satisfies the need for which it was created. One connector above all. That sounded a little like the Lord of the Rings. You're simply imagining it. If you want to create universally usable, fast communications, there is no better choice, but you should always bear in mind that it is much more memory intensive to implement than its other counterparts. There is a huge difference, not only in the speed and complexity of sending data, but also in the number and distance of the devices involved. The UART TTL we often use has a very short range, usually less than two meters. This is far exceeded by RS standards with a range of 12 or even 1200 meters. The CAN bus can be up to one kilometer long, but here the speed has to be reduced considerably to 10 kilobits per second. The maximum speed is available up to 40 meters by the standard. USB, on the other hand, provides a maximum speed up to 5 meters in its 2.0 standards. To sum up, each communication has its advantages and disadvantages. With this closing thought, we come to the end of chapter 10 of Crystal Clear Electronics. We hope you have gained a lot of useful knowledge about UART, CAN and USB communication. Thank you for joining us. In chapter 11, you will learn about analog to digital converters and gain insights into how we can explore our analog world with our digital tools. Don't miss the following video and discover more exciting content. Bye bye. bye.